A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to the chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the strict scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his, his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came upon some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Az Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. reading from the first letter of John. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, 
for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. But this we know, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us. Because he has given us of his spirit, and we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in the world. <coughs> there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment was we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said to his disciples, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ.
In the name of the holy and undivided Trinity, one God. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I've always had a soft spot in my heart for St. Philip the Evangelist. I spent almost an entire year of field education at the parish named for him in South Los Angeles, and I cherished the time that I spent with the congregation. It was there that I learned a very important lesson that I had carried with me throughout my entire ministry. Don't mess with the altar guild. <laughs> but during the Easter season, the lectionary substituted the normal readings from the Hebrew scriptures with readings from the Acts of the Apostles. It's not that the Hebrew scriptures aren't germane to Easter, which we'll see in just a moment, but it was decided that we ought to read about the followers who experienced Jesus firsthand after he rose. Paul did not personally meet uh, Jesus before his crucifixion, but he did encounter him on the road to Damascus at his conversion experience. The results of meeting Christ led Paul and other followers of Jesus to travel extensively in the area of the Mediterranean, healing and tending to those in need, particularly those who were forming the nascent Christian communities. Scholars have determined that the writer of Acts is the same writer as the Gospel of Luke, so we often refer to these two volumes together as Luke-Acts, with a hyphen in between. As a type of shorthand, we call the writer Luke. But in reality, no one really knows who wrote the gospel, uh, this, uh, this particular gospel. We suppose, though, that the writer was a Gentile follower of Jesus, writing about one century after the events described, a time when Gentile Christians were starting to outnumber the Jewish Christians. Luke describes Philip as a Greek-speaking Jew, an angel told Philip what to do in our story, and he immediately did it. In fact, he's described as running up to the eunuch's chariot, eager to engage him in its occupant, to engage his occupant. Before we look at the interaction between the two, it's enlightening to look closely at the eunuch, for his character is packed full of nuances. We know the following from the description of our reading. He was evidently wealthy. He, he was a man of great responsibility, and he was traveling in a very luxurious means of transportation. We can infer that he was devout, since he was reading from the Hebrew scriptures and described as returning back from Jerusalem. His relationship to Judaism, though, is problematic. If he were a Gentile, the closest he could come to the temple would be the outer court, called the Court of the Gentiles. If he were a Jew, he would not have been granted access to the inner areas of the temple either. This is because he was a eunuch, and Deuteronomy and Leviticus allow only marginal participation in Jewish life for men that's view that are viewed as scarred or defective, since they would be unable to be fruitful and multiply. Something that's important to remember is that many of the Jewish laws or restrictions have to do with perpetuating the Jewish race or religion and maintaining their cultural identity. That's a basis for the kosher laws, the prohibition of marrying outside of the faith, and passages in Leviticus regarding homosexuality, among others. The eunuch was educated, as indicated by his reading the scriptures, although he was humble enough to realize that he did not understand what the Isaiah passage meant. He was hospitable, freely inviting Philip up into his chariot to accompany him. Some people think that his race might have been a strike against the eunuch, but there's no indication of that. Remember that Jerusalem was a fairly cosmopolitan city, due in part to the Roman occupation, and it's being a gathering place of Jews from all over the world. His being a eunuch was much more of a mark against him than his race. That's a lot of information. It helps us to set the stage for the next level of interpretation of this passage. The eunuch was reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, verses 7 through 8, and here it is in its entirety. He was oppressed 
and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is being led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of the living. The eunuch wanted to know the identity of the subject of this reading. The text originally referred to Israel or its leaders or its prophets. Christians, however, applied its meaning to Christ. The eunuch wasn't sure what to make out of the passage. Isaiah had given the eunuch some measure of hope because also in Isaiah he would read, For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant. I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. On the one hand, the eunuch had just likely faced discrimination at the temple in Jerusalem, but here in Isaiah he had hope of being seen as a full equal in the future Israel. The eunuch wanted Philip to tell him who was being described in this passage, who could possibly bring about this longed-for change that will enable him to achieve equality. Philip doesn't tell the eunuch what he must do. He doesn't tell him to confess that Jesus Christ as his Savior, get baptized, or even pray. He just tells him about how Jesus fulfills the description of the person mentioned in Isaiah. The man who has been shorn of his manhood connects with the man who was shorn of his clothes and led to his crucifixion. Can it be, he might ask, This reading doesn't just refer to the prophet Isaiah and his time, but also to me now. The good news of Jesus dying for his sins described by Philip was indeed good news for the eunuch. At seminary, there was a one word in particular that all the cool kids used. That word is hermeneutics. Anyone hear of it before? It means interpretation. It's important because everyone who reads the Bible uses it. Everyone, and I mean everyone, reads all texts through the lens of their own experiences. We do not come to a text with a blank slate. We all have backgrounds and experiences that are unique to each of us, and as a result, we interpret what we read as individuals. Through study or group discussion, we might come to a consensus of of what something means, but we still had to interpret what we read. This story in Acts is more about the interpretation of the scriptures than the scriptures themselves. After all, the eunuch was already reading a passage from Isaiah before Philip joined him, and he didn't understand it. He needed someone to interpret the text and guide him in reading. This reinforces for me, at least, the need to use tradition and reason along with scripture in coming to know God and God's coming reign. Our Anglican forebears were right on the money to realize that one needs to approach God from three different directions, scripture, tradition, and reason, that are held in tension with each other. Even, who people, even people who read the Bible literally ultimately have to interpret meaning into their readings since there are so many internal inconsistencies. A blog I read from Donald Schell has the following quote. While a fundamentalist might proclaim, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Responsible Christian theology has always acknowledged that even purported revelation requires interpretation and that at some level the test of good interpretation is that it makes good sense. The comparison of the eunuch to lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender individuals is pretty evident. However, that's not the only uh, option. The more apt comparison, though, is between the eunuch and anyone who is marginalized. It can be those of a different race, different sociological class, different abilities, or anything different from the so-called norm. 
Just about everyone, even those who on the surface had it all, have sometimes felt marginalized. Philip showed the eunuch how Jesus fulfilled the prophecy in Isaiah, thereby freeing him from, its mar- from his marginal condition. And by extension, he has shown the same to us. Today we read that after the eunuch was baptized, he continued on his journey rejoicing. This is the first recorded incidence in the Christian scriptures of a converted g- Gentile going home to spread the good news. Let us do the same. Amen. Please stand as we say together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Lives. Let us acknowledge to God the one life we share, saying, O oh God, who makes us one, hear our prayer. O oh God, your Holy Spirit is alive in all the earth, your spirit that moved and shaped land and sea, trees and beasts still moves and shapes us into creation. Through Christ, we know your one Holy Spirit, for you are God that all the world may know your spirit, we pray, O God, who makes us one, hear our prayer. Open your world before our eyes so that we see far and near. Show us newly what lives around us, over and behind and within. Give us the mind of Christ, O God, who makes us one, hear our prayer. Bring us to one another so we may hear and understand each other. Bring trust and sympathy between the peoples of the world. Make all nations one household with many rooms. O God, who makes us one, hear our prayer. In the Anglican Communion, we pray for the Church of Bangladesh. In our diocese for the clergy and people of St. Andrews by the Lake, Lake Elsinore. In the military cycle of prayer, for USS Curtis Wilbur, DDG 54. O God, who makes us one, hear our prayer. For Michael, our presiding bishop, Susan, our bishop, 
Kirby, our priest, Nancy, our deacon, and all priests and other ministers, and all the people of this congregation who minister in Christ's name. O God, who makes us one, hear our prayer. Heal us who are sick, cheer us who are guilty, love us who are alone, join us who are distant, call all the world to yourself. O God, who makes us one, hear our prayer. Enliven the church with the spirit of Christ, through us, give your loving spirit to a world needing comfort. Make our many gifts one offering for the world. O oh God, who makes us one, hear our prayer. We pray for our own needs and thanksgivings, either silently or aloud. O oh God, who makes us one, hear our prayer. Keep our minds inside your love, for we are many parts and need to be one. We beg this for unity that only your spirit can give through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
Jesus Christ. 
with gladness, singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated Please stand for the blessing. May Almighty God, who has redeemed us and made us his children to the resurrection of his Son, our Lord, bestow upon you the riches of his blessing. Amen. May God, into the water of baptism, has raised us from sin into newness of life, make you holy and worthy to be united with Christ forever. Amen. May God, who has brought us out of bondage to sin, true and lasting freedom in the Redeemer, bring you to your eternal inheritance. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you forever. Amen.
witness to Christ, who gloriously rises from the dead. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. I'm looking forward to it. 